Well, good afternoon, everyone, uh, or early good evening. Thank you for attending uh, this afternoon, early evening. I'm Linda Goff, and I'm president of the New Mexico Jewish Historical Society. And I want to welcome all of you who are from uh, throughout the state here in New Mexico, our friends and colleagues from the Texas Jewish Historical Society, uh, and others beyond. Um, so then let me uh, in, give a brief introduction to Justin Ferrate. A number of you here this evening um, have heard Justin speak for us, uh, the Catskills, the Jewish Catskills, parts one and two, Jewish Harlem, et cetera. Many of you know him and uh, he graciously uh, puts together one speaker program for us each year. And we are delighted to have you back. Um, Justin is an urban historian. Um, he also uh, was uh, the tour uh, lead guide for the Gray Lines in New York and wrote the uh, entrance exam for authorized Gray Line tour operators and has received many uh, recognitions uh, from uh, well-known people in New York City and in New York State. He also is very involved in the art world here in Santa Fe. Um, I also like to refer to him as uh, our Renaissance man. He is a walking encyclopedia <laughs> in so many ways. Um, so then with, uh, as they say, with no further ado, let me hand it over to Justin Ferrate. Now we're going to take a magic journey to the town of Frankfurt am Main. Frankfurt am Main, here is their official seal on the left-hand side, it was part of the Holy Roman Empire. And this is that, uh, that great empire seal. So Frankfurt am Main answered to the Pope, bottom line. Um, it was sort of independent and sort of not independent at the same time. One of the things people forget is the Pope was above every ruler in Europe. So that explains the whole story of, of Edward VIII when he wanted to divorce his wife and the Roman Catholic Church said, you can't divorce your wife. She said, yes, I can, and I'll start my own church. And the Church of England is basically a carbon copy of the, of the Roman Catholic Church minus the Pope. And so that's a very important issue because the Pope calls the shots. And one of the shots that the Pope called that when the Jews were allowed in, in, in the town of, of uh, uh, Frankfurt on Main, they were required to live on this one single street, that curved street there. Um, and here is a picture of the, of the, uh, of the community. Um, and just for fun, up in the upper right-hand side, this was the synagogue, the great synagogue of the Jewish community. Now, the thing is that uh, because it's a ghetto, remember ghetto was always historically only a Jewish word. Ghettos did not refer to any other variety of humanity. Uh, the ghetto was, like all ghettos, rich and poor in the same community. They're all shoved together. The, what creates a ghetto is the wall. Remember the pale? It's the same idea. So here is one of the grand, actually two of the grand mansions of the, of the Judengasse. Um, but I assure you, the bulk of the houses did not measure up to these. Now, the first documented Jews in Frankfurt came in the 12th century. The Jewish community was attacked for the first time in 1214. And then there was another pogrom that took place in 1349. Whew. And then in 1462, the Jewish ghetto was established under the authority of the city's rulers, the Roman Catholic Church. Remember, I talked about the Spanish steps. It's the same idea The Roman Catholic Church said all Jews must live here. So in the 1500s, interestingly enough, although these are essentially Ashkenazi, 
um, uh, the Sephardim were escaping from Spain because the no Jews rule in Spain. And so the community would embrace Sephardim. But often what happens when you have a combination of Sephardic and Ashkenazic uh, uh, groups, what often happens is the, the, the larger group tends to win the, win the game. So things tended to be Ashkenazic even within the Sephardic community. It's sort of an interesting fusion. So over the centuries, Frankfurt became this amazing place for Jewish learning. Many famous rabbis whose authority was respected well beyond that little half moon shaped street that we just saw all, all throughout Europe. Now in the 19th century, because of this questioning because of the uh, conscious uh, scholarly aspect of, of the Jews in Frankfurt, two new Jewish move movements came into existence, Reform Judaism, and remember it's reform, not reformed, because it reform means just a different approach to Judaism, and another different approach to Judaism is neo-orthodoxy. Neo-orthodoxy is sort of a cross between what we might consider conservative and orthodox. It's sort of like modern orthodox today, but remember all of these are labels that are just more to sort of help you sort things out. They're not hard and strict and hard and fast. Now, today's Jewish Museum, which is why I included this image, is the former mansion of the Rothschild family. And adjacent to the Rothschild family is the home of another famous banker, Yosef uh, Itzhak Speyer. So here were the two bankers. Now, they obviously did very well. And again, the Rothschilds are back in the news as of today, because the Rothschilds are, are being accused of having created the concept of, uh, of Charles Darwin's and origin of the species. So now here is the ghetto and from the middle ages onward, all Jews in Frankfurt were required by the Pope to live in Jews alley. The street was overcrowded with poor and affluent mixed together. There were roughly 3000 Jewish inhabitants and every night, every Sunday, every Christian holiday, the gates would be locked at either end of the street. Jews are not allowed to depart. Frankfurt's Jews, as a strict rule, could not enter a public garden. They were not allowed to visit a coffee shop. And what's curious about coffee is, remember, that's an Arabic plant that would come in by way of Vienna, uh, which is, explains why, why uh, uh, Vienna had so many coffee houses. But you are also not allowed to walk more than two abreast in the street. Now, think about it. If you're a family going out for a walk, what are you going to do? Only two people at a time. So the kids all had to be lined up uh, right behind you. Now, although other cities in the German states did impose restrictions on Jews, none of the restrictions in any of the, of the towns that would eventually become part of the country of Germany were as strict as Frankfurt. Now, Frankfurt was also one of the last cities in Europe to allow the Jews to leave the ghetto. And the city council of Frankfurt was incredibly anti-Semitic. So I included, you, included an example for you. The Frankfurt City Council in 1769, I want you to think about that day, the United States Revolutionary War is a, soon to take place. The Frankfurt City Council responded to a Jewish petition to be able to leave the ghetto on Sunday afternoons as an example of the unbounded arrogance of this people who expend every effort to take all opportunities to set themselves up as equals to the Christian citizens. So I think that says it pretty clearly. So Jacob Henry, uh, Jacob Henry Schiff, uh, like all Jews, he had two sets of names. Anyway, uh, Jacob Henry Schiff was born in 1847 in the city state of Frankfurt on Main. Only two years in 1845, the two years prior to Schiff's birth, Frankfurt would begrudgingly allow Jews the rights to be citizens of the city of Frankfurt. 
Now Schiff and his family had been in the city of Frankfurt back to 1370, 500 years earlier, basically. And the family was a distinguished rabbinical family, Ashkenazi. Um, as a young man, Schiff was, you know, a modern Jew. He received a secular and a religious education at what in English is known as the Israelite Religious Society, or uh, in, in Yiddish, Adas Yisrael, or in Hebrew, Adas Yisrael, um, uh, which was a, a very prominent Orthodox Jewish school. Jacob Schiff grew up fairly well off in this land of poverty. So uh, and it, the, it was not, I to say, it must have created some rather strange tensions. So Jacob Schiff's early years uh, were with his family. His father, Moses Schiff, was a broker for the Rothschild Banking House, and, and, and uh, they shared the same home. Um, uh, the Rothschilds were very close to Jacob Schiff's father, and uh, he was an employee. And so half of the house would belong to the Schiffs, and half of the house would belong to the Rothschilds. The name Schiff means a ship in German and in Yiddish, and it, and it probably originated from a shield because Jews didn't have last names. So how do you say, find my address? There are no numbers on the houses. So the way you used, used we put a sign out in front. In this case, probably there's every reason to believe they put a sign out with a ship on it and the ship, meaning ship, uh, would become the seal. Now, um, the Rothschild family, on the other hand, can be traced back to the 1500s, a little bit later. They're the new kids on the block. Um, and the Judengasse would be described by, by the German author Goethe as a hellish slum. The ghetto, as I said, was essentially a prison for the 3,000 plus Jews who were required by law to live there. They could not live anywhere else. Now, as I said, since Jews didn't have last names, they often came up with signs. Now, that is why you will often you see names like Ben or Bar as part of the name, because that means son of or Bas, because that's the daughter of. And so you will often see those. But um, historically, you were always known by the, the, the first name and the second name would maybe have something to do with your parentage, but it wasn't a last name as we tend to think of as last names because the Rothschild family lived in a house and this is verifiable, in a house with a red shield, they became known as Rothschild, the people with the Rothschild, which is why I'm very adamant that the name should never be pronounced Roth child, because it isn't Rothschild, you're breaking the word at the wrong place, it's Roth as in red, shield, Rothschild or red shield. Now, the amazing thing about the Rothschild family is they actually would get a crest of arms, here's their coat of arms right here, and I want to tell you that is a very, very, very rare occurrence for any Jewish family. So, Fast forward, 1877, there's a brand new country called Germany. Now, in the United States, we tend to think of Germany as like being around since, since forever. It's older than I am. So anyway, but Germany wasn't around forever. It wasn't, and it isn't. The nation of Germany is a little more than a century old. You know, the United States is older than Germany by far. Now, before 1871, Germany was not a nation. It was simply 39 individual and very independent say translate as we're the best. And every, every individual city state believed they were the best. Now, the founder of Germany, Otto von Bismarck, had a rather formidable task of convincing proud Prussians and Bavarians and Rhinelanders to simply stop being whatever they claimed to be and the pride in that and instead to become Germans. Now, this all came around because this guy named Napoleon had conquered the Holy Roman Empire and took over all of these city-states. When, the, when Napoleon would be conquered, the idea for a nation 
would be a very influential idea. And so that would be the this inspiration for the creation of Germany. So ironically, it was the French ruler who would inspire the Germans to become a German country. So under, uh, under Kaiser Wilhelm I, Germany would be united in 1871. And it was a rather amazing thing because suddenly Germany, this brand new country, would rival the empires of Britain and France. And that would only change with their defeat in World War I. So the first thing you do is you become a country, then you try to take over the universe. So now when Jacob Schiff made his first journey to the United States in 1867, he was leaving his native Frankfurt behind, but not his native Germany, since there was no such country as Germany. Germany did not exist until Jacob Schiff was living in the United States in 1871. So who is this guy? So he, he studied at banking with his father at the age of 14 with the Rothschild family. The Rothschild family has a tremendous influence on Jacob Schiff, not only as a teenager, but throughout his entire life. They were family friends and also financial supporters. So Jacob Schiff goes to the United States in 1865, just as the Civil War had ended. And as you know, at the end of any war, there's a huge flurry and there's a lot of energy and activity, sometimes better and sometimes for the worse. So what happened is he caught on the cusp of sort of the up mode and he would start a, a, a brokerage firm called Frank and Gons. Um, uh, he would go to a firm called Frank and Gons, but uh, within two years, when he was 20 years old, he would found the firm of Budge Schiff and Company. It didn't last long. It, it only survived uh, uh, for a few years, and blessedly so, because it was dissolved in 1872, and then in 1873 was the Panic of 1873. Now, the Panic of 1873 was the 19th century equivalent of the 20th century Depression. It was everything bottomed out. So by this time, Schiff said, I think this is where I want to be. So he became an American citizen, something of which he was proud for the remainder of his life. So here's his kid, age 23, who then joins forces with major financiers in New York, H.B. Claflin, Marcellus Hartley, Robert Cuttingen, Joseph Seligman. If any of you are from New York, you probably recognize some of those names. They would found a major bank called the German American Bank, the German American Bank, and that's their building on the right-hand side. So this is not, you know, some, you know, show window in a shopping mall. Um, and the German American Bank would, uh, uh, would become the Continental Bank of New York around 1929 after Jacob Schiff is now deceased. And then in 1948, it merged with Chemical Bank. And many of you undoubtedly know Chemical Bank. So that was a bank that in part was founded by Jacob Schiff. So when the firm was, was eliminated, when, when they, they simply went out of business, Schiff had to make some decisions. His family, there were some health issues in the family, so he wanted to be closer to home. So he accepted a job in, uh, uh, in Hamburg with the London and Hanseatic Bank with a very important family friend and banker, Moritz Warburg. Um, now, this will play out later in Jacob Schiff's life because his daughter, Frida, will marry Felix Warburg. So, again, it's a very common thing within the German Jewish families for family, that any Jewish family, uh, for families to intermarry with families. So, you'll find a lot of people who are first cousins, second cousins, who are all intermarried. Now, while in Europe, uh, Schiff who was a brilliant man by any standard, uh, developed an excellent international reputation and cultivated connections with some of the cheap European banking houses that would prove valuable in future decades. I had to eliminate it in the uh, effort for uh, brevity, but he would become friends with three of the most powerful bankers in all of Europe, and those bankers would help 
Jacob Schiff onto the next phase of his career, which was when he was approached by Abraham Kuhn of the firm of Kuhn Loeb and Company in New York City. He would be, in, he would be invited to join. And so Jacob Schiff would go back to New York. Very importantly, we're going to, there's going to be a woman involved here. So Jacob Schiff would actually meet uh, Teresa, uh, Teresa Loeb um, when he was having those early meetings in Germany, and he was quite captivated by her. And so in 1875, the two would marry, and thus Jacob Schiff was now the son-in-law <coughs> of his boss. So after his daughter was married, Solomon Loeb gave Jacob Schiff a full partnership with Kuhn Loeb and Company. Ten years later, Solomon Loeb would retire, and Schiff officially became the director of Kuhn Loeb and Company. Now, indicative of who Jacob Schiff was, and indicative of his humility and his devotion to his wife's family, he chose never to change the firm's name to include his own even though Jacob Schiff was undoubtedly and indis indisputably the leader of the firm throughout his lifetime. So Therese Schiff was Solomon, was, uh, Solomon Loeb's daughter. Solomon Loeb had come from the town of Worms in Germany, which uh, in, uh, the uh, uh, quick jump back into history. In 1848, there were a series of revolutions throughout Europe. One of the things that would be in part started by Napoleon's uh, taking over much of Europe, and people got the idea, well, maybe we can be independent nations. There were numerous revolutions, but in Germany, there was a tremendous revolution in 1848 that failed. And it was a revolution of the intellectuals, and many of the people were the, you know, the academes, all the people from colleges and schools, uh, uh, ministerial people, rabbis. There were people of, of, of knowledge and sophistication, but they lost. So uh, many of the Germans came to the United States at that time. And when you look at German immigration, you'll see that's a tremendous point in time for German immigration throughout the country. Now, in 1867, Solomon Loeb would move his firm, Kuhn and Loeb, which he'd started in Cincinnati. And I want to point out Cincinnati is where the Union Theologia, I'm sorry, where the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, the, the Theological Society for Reformed Jews, which we'll talk about later, that is where the Reformed Jews live. That's why the, the uh, Hebrew Union is located in Cincinnati. That's where it's founding place. But in any case, Loeb would move to New York City and he would become part of an elite German group, Jewish group known as Our Crowd. There's a very famous book I've shown the cover here by Stephen Birmingham. It's very uh, easy reading, very light reading, very funny reading, very enlightening reading um, about the history of the German Jews, the wealthy German Jews of 19th century and early 20th century New York. Now, Therese Schiff was raised in an agnostic household. Her family was not religious, and Jacob Schiff was raised as an Orthodox Jew. One would expect this would call conflict, cause conflict within the Union, but that such seemed not to be the case. Um, uh, they loved each other without question, and uh, they had a very, very happy marriage throughout their lifetimes. Um, Jacob Schiff, however, being Orthodox, would pray daily, and he absolutely would not conduct business on the Sabbath, which came to much consternation with a man with whom he later worked, a man named J.P. Morgan, because J.P. Morgan was upset that Schiff would not work on a Saturday, uh, even if it meant making more money to do so. Now, like most other people in the social set, the Schiffs were actively involved in American reform Judaism. This is, remember, the, the Frankfurt Judaism that has now been transformed and brought to the United States. And this would become a uh, part of a social milieu as well as a spiritual milieu. Now, uh, to give you an idea about how important being an American was, on 1890, Frieda Schiff would be confirmed 
that's a Reformed Jewish tradition, um, it would be confirmed and the shifts would donate a set of Torah ornaments. These are the crowns on your Torah scroll to the synagogue. And they were decorated with an American flag and an American eagle to symbolize their commitment to American Jewry and to the United States. As I mentioned before, Schiff's affiliation with the United States was unwavering. This was not an uncommon thing. If any of you have lived in towns with old synagogues, meaning 19th century synagogues, look carefully. You may actually see the stars and stripes on the side of the synagogue because Jews often try to convey to the world that they are Jewish and American. They're very importantly American uh, uh, believers. Now, how did Jacob Schiff make his money? Well, he made it through a very important thing that made him a lot of money. Jacob Schiff would, because of his European connections, become internationally famous because he saw the invention of the railroad as being cutting edge. The late 19th century was when the railroad was in its heyday. Now, it was a chancy operation. I don't want you to have any sense that this is like, if you buy a thousand shares of this, you'll be rich overnight. Oh, if I'd only bought those stocks of Apple, I'd be retired now. Um, that's not what it was about. It was a potentially very questionable uh, investment, but, if the investment came through, you came through big time, you made a lot of money. And so what Jacob Schiff did is he not only funded the railroads, but he also helped supervise the railroads to ensure their financial stability. It was a very important part of his role. So he was more than just the guy who said, here, I'll give you a loan for you know, $2 million. So Jacob Schiff saw that the railroad had great promise for the country and also great opportunities to profit. So uh, Schiff would transform Kuhn Loeb and Company, which originally did small time loans to Jewish businessmen, no great shakes, you know, I want to expand my Schmata line, you know, that kind of loan. It wasn't, they weren't big, big players. It turned them into a major player on Wall Street. And the firm's first meaningful entry into railroad was in 1877, when the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad event any of you know Chicago, that's the railroad that still runs through Chicago. And uh, he would raise the funds to build that railroad. And several years later, very important and truly a feather in his proverbial cap, he became the funding agency for the Pennsylvania Railroad, as well as the Milwaukee, I'm sorry, Chicago, Milwaukee, and St. Paul Railroad. So as a banker and a philanthropist, Jacob Schiff typified what expansionism in this country was all about. The Schiff era, as it is still called to this day, was from 1880 to 1920. It would transform the United States essentially from being a somewhat backwater country to being a major industrialized nation. Under his innovative leadership, Schiff would transform Kuhn and Loeb, Kuhn, Loeb and Company into a major enterprise by marketing the bonds of every major United States railroad. Every major railroad in this country was underwritten by Jacob Schiff and his company. Now, the completion of the railroad embodied the fulfillment of, of continental travel. You could literally travel from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean by railway from sea to shining sea. So at the beginning of the 20th century, Jacob Schiff would, because of his connection with the Pennsylvania Railroad, would finance the creation of both the rather incredible engineering feat of the underwater Hudson River tubes, which allow trains to travel underneath the soil of the Hudson River from New Jersey into Manhattan. Every railroad line wanted that Manhattan connection, but Schiff made it happen. And he also funded what is probably the greatest neoclassical building ever built in New York City, Pennsylvania Station. Pennsylvania Station is well-loved and well-renowned, built by the famous firm of McKim, Mead & White. It is arguably the most build, beautiful building in America to ever be destroyed. 
uh, but Pennsylvania Station was inspirational. You can see it in the movies, you can play the music to Pennsylvania 65000 by Glenn Miller, and you understand that it captured the pulse of America, and that was the pulse created by Jacob Schiff. Now, Jacob Schiff, again, understood how things were interconnected. So he invested in sim uh, related enterprises such as Western Union, Telegraph and Cable. He would, uh, would create a, a consortium for the American Smelting and Refining Company, which would then fuse all of the Guggenheim operations with their former competitor. And the Guggenheims became wealthy because of Jacob Schiff. Jacob Schiff would also be invest in, uh, invest in Wells Fargo, in Westinghouse Electric, at the uh, Equitable Life Assurance Company, which still exists today, the National City Bank. Look up these names and you realize virtually all these corporations still exist today, and they exist today because of Jacob Schiff. The list of businesses goes on and on and on. There are countless other businesses. So the Schiff era, uh, Schiff as the uh, incredible uh, financier who, who understood how to put money together, put money packages together, and how to make the business successful would transform not only New York City, it would transform the entire United States. And from his base on Wall Street from 1880 to 1920, Jacob Schiff not only became the world's most renowned financier, he also became known as the most important Jewish leader in the United States. So though Schiff was a spiritually orthodox Jew, he was closely linked with Reform Judaism and was a trustee at Temple Beth El in New York City. Beth El was a synagogue of choice for his daily shakarit. Um, uh, he would, for Shabbat, if he went to services, generally did Shabbat at home with his family, but if he went to Shabbat services, he would go to Temple Emmanuel. Uh, uh, the uh, Temple Beth El was located on 5th Avenue at 76th Street by Arnold Brunner, a man whose name will come back later. But uh, sadly, the building is no longer, but they took the remnants of this synagogue and incorporated it into a later building for Temple Emmanuel when the two congregations would, uh, would merge uh, in the uh, early 20th century. Jacob Schiff was also a member simultaneously of Temple Emmanuel, which at that time was located on Fifth Avenue, right near today's New York Public Library. In fact, if you go into the New York Public Library, you can see a wonderful mural by the artist Richard Haas, who does Trump Louis Fool the Eye images. And what he shows is an image looking north on Fifth Avenue, showing you Temple Emmanuel. I always like to visit Temple Emmanuel when I'm at the New York Public Library. Um, the doors to the Ark that were contributed by Jacob Schiff to Temple Emmanuel were by this kid named Louis Comfort Tiffany, and those doors were considered so valuable, so beautiful, so magnificent, they were moved uptown when the new Temple Emmanuel would be built on 65th Street and 5th Avenue in 1929. By this time, Jacob Schiff has been deceased for nine years, so Jacob Schiff never saw the new Temple Emmanuel, and he never saw his uh, doors to the Ark of the Covenant in their new home on 65th and 5th. Uh, just as a point of information, the building of the synagogue on that location was a bit of a social coup because it had formerly been the home on that site of the Queen of New York, Carolyn Skirmerhorn Astor, otherwise known in New York as the Mrs. Astor. So here is Jacob Schiff with his wife, Therese, as they're out for a stroll. He was not a big man, but he held himself with great posture and a sense of decorum, was always neatly dressed, and he appeared to be much bigger than he actually was. He was about five foot four. Um, and being a good Jewish father, he, he loved his kids, and so he hired 
probably the most famous sculptor of the 19th century, Augustus and Gaudens, to design the bronze that you see on your left-hand side. This bronze is a figure of, of uh, uh, the children of Jacob and Teresh Schiff, Mortimer Leo, that's Mortimer there on the left-hand side, and Frida Fanny, this is the woman who would later marry Felix Warburg and whose home is now the Jewish Museum in New York. This is often considered a magnificent double portrait, but I think of it as a triple portrait because he's also got this great Irish wolf out. What I find interesting is notice how Mortimer's foot is actually stepping out of the picture frame, looking at, toward you. And he is younger than his sister, but he's being the young man who's going to protect his sister. And here is Mortimer here. You see a later version done in marble uh, that was created at the behest of Jacob Schiff and see Mortimer carrying his, his hat and, and very proudly standing by his sister who's being maybe a little patient with him. But what I love is the patience shown on the face of that Irish wolfhound is saying, all right, they want to go for a walk. I guess we'll go for a walk. It's a wonderful personal image. And you can see the marble rendition which Jacob Schiff commissioned specifically for the Metropolitan Museum. He loved the work so much himself that he kept the original, but he created this one so that others could enjoy the talents and the skill of what was probably the most important sculptor in 19th century history, Augustus in Gaudens. Among many other things, Jacob Schiff was a major donor to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Now here is Jacob Schiff and his family. This is their summer house in Bar Harbor, Maine. Here you can see Therese Schiff with a grandchild. She's holding a bouquet of flowers. Here's Jacob Schiff with yet another grandchild. And look at all the generations of family altogether. Uh, family was first and foremost. Any holiday was spent with the family. Um, there was never any possibility of going elsewhere. The Schiffs, of course, in order to sort of a sort of symbol of their status, had to build a Fifth Avenue mansion. This was their home at 78th Street and Fifth Avenue uh, building is no longer extant. And because again, for social reasons, he, he had to be a member of the club. Clubs have a, uh, men's clubs have a historical function of basically being the lubricant for business people to talk business. Curiously, some of the clubs actually have rules that you can't talk business, but everyone ends up doing it one way or another. But the Jews were not permitted to be a member of any of the other social clubs in New York City. And so the Jews started their own club called the Harmony Club. The Harmony Club would move as the Jewish community, the German Jewish community moved. And so here's the Harmony Club that Jacob Schiff knew on the left-hand side. This was directly across the street from where today's New York Public Library is. And then later when the club moved uptown to 60th Street and Jacob Schiff was also a member of this, the club in this building, this was designed by the world renowned architect Stanford White. Interestingly enough, men's clubs were strictly sexually segregated. There was not a Gentile club in the United States that allowed women. But the Harmony Club, well, it was basically modeled after these British men's club was a male only domain, unusual for the time. Four times a year, the women were welcome to celebratory events, which also allowed them to enjoy the lavish interiors of the club. So today, the Harmony Club is the second oldest social club in New York City. So even with all of his affluence, all of his wealth, all of his power, all of his noted stature, Jacob Schiff was no stranger to anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism was pervasive in New York City throughout Jacob Schiff's lifetime. By necessity, he was obliged to work for a German Jewish banking firm. No Christian bank would have ever employed Jacob Schiff. Think about it. This is the guy who brought in millions and millions and millions of dollars. But because he was a Jew, that just wouldn't work. So throughout his career, financier J.P. Morgan, for example, referred to Schiff as that foreigner. Now, this is a man who lived his entire adult life in the United States, 
but because of Morgan's absolute distaste for Jews, uh, insisted on calling him that foreigner. Eventually, by the 1900s, Morgan was obliged to conduct business with, with Jacob Schiff and with Kuhn Loeb, but that was strictly out of economic necessity, and J.P. Morgan was at no pains whatsoever to declare to the world, I'm only doing it because I have to. Morgan, like his compatriots, refused to socialize with Jews, and Morgan's favorite hobby was sailing, and that was famously captured in this quotation from J.P. Morgan that conveyed the prevailing prejudice against Jews, business can be conducted with anyone, but one can only sail with a gentleman. Needless to say, Jacob Schiff was not considered a gentleman. Jews have often been, it's often been suggested that Jews are dancing on the edge of a volcano, that idea of, uh, of uh, doing things that are exciting and extravagant at the moment of devastation. And that indeed has been true of much of Jewish history. And just as it was true historically, it was true at that time. So in the Russian empire during the same period of time, this is all going on, Devastating pogroms were increasing. Thousands of Jews were being killed in Eastern Europe and their homes would be destroyed. The synagogues would be ravished. Pogroms or disasters were large scale targeted. Remember, this is, no one just didn't accidentally get involved in a pogrom. They were targeted and repeatedly uh, anti-Jewish riots that began in 1821 and continued into the 1940s. So we're talking over a hundred years of the pogroms. The most famous pogroms took place in Eastern Europe in the late 19th and early 20th century. These pogroms are often inst inst instigated by the Russian Tsar or the R Russian Orthodox Church. Just to give you a little sense, between 1881 and 1884, that's three years, more than 200 anti-Jewish events occurred in the Russian Empire. Most notable of these were the pogroms in Kiev, in Warsaw, and in Odessa. Now, in 1903 to 1906, even bloodier pogroms were authorized, and the deaths were so great that the Russian censors absolutely made it a law that no reporter was allowed to legally permit the actual number of people who were killed in those pogroms. During these pogroms, thousands of homes were destroyed. Many families were reduced to abject poverty as if they weren't poor before. And then large numbers of men, women, and children were murdered or seriously injured in 166 towns of the southwestern provinces of the empire, such as Ukraine. Jacob Schiff was greatly disturbed by the anti-Semitism demonstrated by the Russian Empire. So for the remainder of his life and in countless ways, Schiff would challenge anti-Semitism and work to create a better life for all of those Eastern European Jews by bringing them to the United States. Here's Jewish emigration from Russia. And we can see 1880 to 1928, the width of the line defines the numbers. And you'll see the greatest number uh, here uh, uh, were between 250,000 and 2 million people dependent on the period of time. There were over 2 million Jews who came to the United States by 1924. Now, Castle Garden was the point of entry and you would enter into Castle Garden. Castle Garden is a little tiny fort at the bottom of the island of Manhattan, built for the War of 1812 to protect New York from the British. The British did not attack New York. Instead, they burnt down the United States Capitol. So this fort was never actually used as a fort. It became a major performance hall for Jenny Lind, the great Swedish Nightingale, but it also became the immigration depot for New York City. I want to point out it's emigration, and there is a difference. All the words are often used interchangeably. An emigrant is someone who leaves a country. An immigrant is someone who becomes part of a country. So an emigrant 
for, I'll give you an example. Uh, several million Ukrainians have emigrated from U Ukraine in the last weeks. They've gone to countries such as Poland, and if they remain in Poland and they choose to become citizens of Poland, they will then become immigrants. So immigrants are people who end up staying, but an immigrant is someone arriving. So when you arrive, you're an immigrant. If you stay, you're an immigrant. So you'll find those two words often used interchangeably, and they're really not entirely interchangeable. So the, the Jews would come here to Castle Garden. The problem was it's a tiny little fort. There just isn't enough room to process all those Jews. So the Jews would be shipped off. You'd get to, to uh, Castle Garden, immediately be put on a ferry, go up the East River. For those of you who know Manhattan, you'll be going past Roosevelt Island all the way north to Ward's Island. Uh, if you were to draw a line across Ward Island and Manhattan, you'd be in the middle of Central Park. So uh, that was where the Jews were shipped. And then in the 1880s, a very unlikely social radical, a young Sephardic woman named Emma Lazarus, whose family is a very old New York family, would follow the recommendation of a reformed Jewish rabbi from Temple Emmanuel, a very famous rabbi, Gustav Gottheil. Um, uh, she was instructed to follow the guidelines of Maimonides. So when she followed the instructions, she would work on behalf of the Jews escaping the pogroms of the Russian Empire and arriving at the emigration depot at Ward's Island. Um, Emma Lazarus is from a well-to-do family. They are some of the earliest Jews in the United States. Um, and, uh, you know, they were wealthy. It was, these weren't her people. Uh, she was Sephardic. They were Ashkenaz. You know, they, they were, and in the idea of Maimonides, they were those to whom she was not related. So she was not getting anything specifically back. The first thing she did upon following the rabbi's instructions was to write an article for the New York Times called Among the Russian Jews. If any of you uh, are subscribers to the Times, you can go back and find this article in the Times uh, on the internet. Um, and when she realized the job was bigger than she was, she asked Jacob Schiff to join her. And one of the interesting things about Jacob Schiff are the number of women who came to, um, there is a, a rabbinic thing that, that God only comes when he hears a certain cry. And when that cry is heard, such as the Israelites in Egypt cried out, that cry is heard by God. And so in essence, Emma Lazarus made a cry. And that cry was to Jacob Schiff, who then would create these buildings. But being the man he was, he specifically stipulated these buildings weren't for Jews, they were for everyone. And he stipulated the buildings had to be used in a non-sectarian manner because that was the point. So he would build. So if any of your families came to this country in the in the uh, early to late 1900s, your family probably didn't come through Ellis Island. So if you can't find those records, that's why, because they didn't come through Ellis Island. They came through Castle Garden, and there is a website. Uh, for uh, the Castle Garden uh, immigration list. So you can go to the immigration list, look up Castle Garden immigration, and that'll lead you to the appropriate website. So Emma Lazarus was um, a dedicated worker. She was also a young writer, and she was asked to write a poem to help raise money to build the pedestal for the statue whose official name is Liberty Enlightening the World. We call it the Statue of Liberty. In her sonnet, she universalized her language. She made the language like Jacob Schiff's dictate of this must be for everyone. What she did was to require that uh, uh, to, to make the poem apply to all and everyone. So think of the Jews when you hear these phrases. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these the homeless. Tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. And think of those Russian immigrants coming to the new world 
when you hear that. So in 1890, the United States government said, enough of these states handling immigration, the federal government should do it. So uh, Castle Garden was no longer used. The uh, immigration was done through Ellis Island, a series of wooden buildings which you see on the bottom of your image. And unfortunately being wood, they were subject to fire and that's exactly what happened. They burned down to the ground um, in, 18, um, uh, in, in the 1892. So in 1897, they would build this building right here, this grand red brick building, which is the building we all think of as Ellis Island. And notice how the minaret towers of the building were designed to look like they're from an exotic otherworldly place. Ellis Island fulfilled its function and processed over 12 million people uh, while it was open from 1897 to 1954, from 1900 to 1954. So important to this picture again is Jacob Schiff. Jacob Schiff understands the people being processed through Ellis Island. Many of those are the Jews from Eastern Europe. And he personally made it a point to connect with William Williams. William Williams, again, a name you may not know, but he was a federal commissioner of immigration for the Port of New York for two periods from 1902 to 1905, and then again from 1909 to 1914. And if any of your family members came to the United States at that time, chances are good that your family came under the aegis of William Williams. William Williams was about taking care of the immigrants, making sure things were fair, just making things suitable. And Jacob Schiff was right there making sure that, that William Williams fulfilled his obligation. So uh, our next word for the day will be Sadaka. Sadaka, uh, even with all of his obligations, Jacob Schiff practiced Sadaka. Countless enterprises uh, that addressed anti-Semitism, care for needy immigrants, uh, Jewish enterprises, and even though he himself was pro-American, he addressed the rise of Zionism. And some of you probably remember a famous pop singer named Neil Sedaka. Now you know where his name comes from. So Sedaka is uh, a, a Jew's covenant with God. Um, and in Hebrew, there is no such word as charity. Sadaka means justice or righteousness. It's to do your obligation to do good. Sadaka is a, is a one-way street. You give, it doesn't come back. Your obligation is not to receive anything in return. Uh, there are many charities. Charity is an English word. Charity implies I do this for this, you, and you'll do this for me. I will, I will give you a place to, to sleep. I'll give you food, and you'll come to my church. Um, um, many, I, I'm doing work on settlement houses, many of the Christian settlement houses basically would inculcate people with the religion of the group. Interestingly enough, none of the Jewish settlement houses ever had any obligation of observing Judaism. There was no regular, because that defiles the concept of Sadaka. Jacob Schiff designated from his childhood one-tenth of his income to helping others. And as an adult, he actually considered, gave considerably more. All of this is based on Maimonides' letter of, a uh, ladder of Sadaka, Maimonides, the medieval Sephardic Jewish philosopher who became one of the most important Torah scholars of the Middle Ages, whose writings are revered today. So here at the very bottom, giving unwilling after being asked. I mean, all right, all right, I'll give you. Okay, that's the very bottom line of Sadaka. Remember, this is not a choice, it's a duty. So you got to give, maybe you don't do it with a smile on your face. Or you do, you give a little bit with a, after being asked. Okay, yeah, can you help? Okay, let me see. I think I have some fair change in the back here. That giving a sufficient amount when being asked. The idea is you're doing great things. Here, let me do this to help you giving directly to the needy without being asked. Understanding there are people out there who are in need. What can I do to help them? And then the fifth level is giving anonymously without even knowing who you're giving to. Just 
let me make this gift, be it, and it doesn't have to be money, although it often is money, but it's doing something that will help someone who is in need. And then number six is giving anonymously to someone you know is needy, making it a point that this person's in need, so let me go see what I can do. The seventh level is where the both the giver and the receiver are anonymous. Uh, in New York City, where I lived for many years, when you look at programs, you'll see the donors often anonymous, 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 anonymous. Those are the people who are following the rules of Sadaka. Either that or they'll give the, the gift in the name of someone else as a memory. Now, number eight, the very top of the list is helping someone else become self sufficient. Uh, um, the interesting thing with Jacob Schiff is he fulfilled many of these levels, but I want to point out that during Jacob Schiff's life, nearly his entire life, there was no income tax, and because there was no income tax, there were no tax advantages. It's not like you got, to, okay, let's give away, you know, as a former president once did, gave away his underwear and declared it for a tax advantage. But the German and Sephardic Jewish opposition is often raised. And this is something I want to underscore. At one level, yeah, it's true. But on another level, it's absolutely not. And it's a very complex thing. And the nostrum of the German Jews look down on the new Eastern European Jews. The Sephardic Jews look down on the new Eastern European Jews. There's a very real issue, which is called prejudice and racism going on in the United States. But Jacob Schiff worked with people like Emma Lazarus, Lillian Wald, Annie Nathan Meyer. And I have every reason to believe his desire to help others was demonstrably genuine. Uh, I'm not saying that the Ashkenazim and the Sephardim weren't a little uneasy because they had fought really hard to get where they were. And it was a very uncertain position, just as Jews in the United States are still in an uncertain position. So people tend to forget that these weren't successful Jews. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, oh, those awful people keep them away. It really wasn't that. But people were having to deal with conflicting emotions. And I think that's a, probably the best way to describe it. Jacob Schiff and other Jews such as Baron de Hirsch joined with groups such as B'nai B'rith to help resettle Jews throughout the United States because they were afraid of the tremendous overcrowding in Manhattan and what that would do to the anti-Semitic forces that were extant. Now, what am I talking about? More than 2.5 Eastern European Jews arrived in the United States, and almost a third of those ended up in one neighborhood in New York City on the Lower East Side, making it not only the largest Jewish community in the world, but also, quite frankly, the most crowded place on the planet Earth. At least 250,000 people occupied one square mile on the Lower East Side. Just think about that, 250,000 people. Just for a rough comparison, where those who want to do numbers, less than 71,000 people live today in one square mile of Manhattan. Many people of you will say, oh, but New York is so crowded. So, so here is an anti-Semitic cartoon from 1892, a very popular humor magazine, humor in quotation marks. We'll see the Tsar of Russia with his whip chasing the Jews across the ocean where they're coming with their rucksacks all packed with all their earthly goods. You'll see the sign that says New York, but someone's crossed out York and made it New Jerusalem. You will see Goldstein Steinberg. You'll see Aaron Levy. The only Mo Jewish name that's authentic is Pulitzer. That was the famous world newspaper. You will see here people with old Dutch and English names leaving to the West. And, and basically the implication is the Jews are coming. You better leave town. Thank you very much. Justin, thank you so much for a wonderful program tonight. And again, thank you and have a good evening. Good night. Thank you all very, very much. Mm -hmm.